The gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, before I begin, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on the topic of this special order. And without objection. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tonight I rise on behalf of our veterans who return home with the mental wounds of war. For generations, we have sent our sons and daughters into harm's way. Through generations, they have served this country honorably. They don't come home in the same peace of that in which they left. There were generations who came back to the United States and didn't even receive a thank you. There wasn't even a, a handshake or a hug waiting for them. For our Vietnam veterans watching at home, we say to this day, welcome home, because when they first came home, they were spat on. Fortunately, we've learned a lesson from that generation. And for me and my generation, as we return back from Iraq and Afghanistan, there is a thank you, but so much more that needs to be done. So that's why we are here tonight for this special order on behalf of our veterans who return home with the mental wounds of war. Each and every one of our congressional districts is home to these veterans. For me, I represent Suffolk County, New York, on the east end of Long Island. We are proud that not only do we have the highest veterans population of any county in New York, we have the second highest veterans population of any county in the country. And we have veterans who come home with family, friends, people who they work with, who don't understand what it is that their loved one or their colleague is going through. Isolated and alone, too many of our veterans are losing their struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. And there is so much more that each and every one of us can do on their behalf. Tonight is a bipartisan special order. Uh, we are joined uh, tonight by a colleague from Arizona who has led the fight on a national level on behalf of men and women from all corners of this country struggling with a recovery from suicide attempts and efforts to prevent that attempt in the first place. I commend uh, Ms. Cinema from Arizona and I recognize her at this time. Thank you, Congressman Zeldin, for organizing this special order hour and for bringing attention to this important issue. An estimated 22 American veterans die by suicide every day. These men and women are our neighbors and our friends, our sons and our daughters, our mothers and our fathers. Veteran suicide is too important an issue to be overshadowed by partisan politics. It's why we've come together tonight to show our commitment to veterans who've given so much to keep America safe. We must do more, Congress, the VA, the American public, to end the epidemic of veteran suicide and to ensure veterans and their families have access to the best possible mental health care. This is a responsibility we all share. That's why I support Congressman Zeldin's legislation the PFC Joseph P. Dwyer Veteran Peer Support Program to expand access to peer-to-peer -peer counseling for veterans. A battle buddy can open the door to the care and support of veteran needs, and we must support efforts to expand the availability and accessibility of mental health care. No one who returns home from serving our country should ever feel like he or she has nowhere to turn. I've often shared the story of a young veteran in my district, Sergeant Daniel Somers. Sergeant Somers was an Army veteran of two tours in Iraq. Diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder, 
Sergeant Somers ultimately took his own life after struggling with the VA bureaucracy and not getting the help he needed in time. Together with the Somers family, we have worked to develop legislation to ensure that all veterans, including those with classified experiences, get immediate access to mental health services in the appropriate care setting. The Daniel Somers Act was combined with Congresswoman Julia Brownlee's Female Veterans Suicide Prevention Act and passed unanimously by the House of Representatives. Senator John Tester introduced companion legislation in the Senate, and we continue to work to get this bill signed into law. I pledge to continue working with my colleagues to ensure that no veteran feels trapped like Sergeant Somers did, and that all of our veterans have access to appropriate mental health care. Thank you, Congressman Zeldin, for your work on behalf of our veterans and for hosting this bipartisan special order on veterans' mental health care. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to uh, commend Ms. Cinema for her efforts on behalf of the, the Somers family. You know, we, we lose a lot of our sons and daughters in harm's way, and there is reflection for that family uh, as to what that sacrifice accomplished. And I guess it depends on the year, the place, the circumstances. Uh, but for the Somers family, uh, they know that they have a champion here fighting uh, on their behalf so that the sacrifice was not for naught. Uh, a legacy is left behind that those who struggle moving forward might have a, a helping hand. Uh, and I thank uh, Ms. Cinema for advocacy, not just on behalf of uh, the Somers family and her district, but for all of our veterans uh, who need more help all across America. At this time, I'd like to recognize gentlemen from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss, and I uh, thank him for uh, his, his efforts in his home state for joining this cause tonight on behalf of our veterans uh, who not only uh, are, are going to benefit from the immediate effort of uh, this chamber with all the different ideas that are before it now, uh, but really for the decades and generations still to serve ahead. And I yield to the gentleman at this time. Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman from New York for yielding, and I thank him for his service to this country. Uh, having himself put on the uniform uh, prior to his uh, uh, coming to this Congress, he's one of the greatest assets we have in this chamber, uh, and it's just a real pleasure to have gotten to know him over the last year and a half and to call him a friend. Uh, when this country makes a decision to send people to war, we need to understand that the people own that decision. What does that mean? It means when we put people out in harm's way, our servicemen and servicewomen, we better be there when they come home. It's a principle of solidarity. They stand for us. We have to stand for them. I'm joining the special order today because I want to, again, bring attention to this serious issue that should trouble everyone's conscience. We have been made painfully aware in the past several years that the VA has failed in a number of ways to adequately serve our nation's veterans. As I understand it, while most Americans are patriotic, too few have taken the time to develop empathy for what our veterans go through, especially in combat. Mr. Speaker, everyone in America needs to be engaging our veterans. This is all hands on deck. We all know veterans. It's good to ask them about their service and to walk with them. As I have talked to veterans across my district, here's a, I, I asked for some emails from them because I knew I was going to be coming to have this special order. Quote, the United States isn't united in purpose, one veteran explained to me. Quote, we're divided, fighting a global war with a peacetime mindset. Americans have never, never been farther away from our nation's veterans, from what it takes to defend our nation's freedom. The true cost of war is lost on most, he added. The failure to understand what veterans have gone through is not just characteristic of the broader population, but it is also a problem at the VA, an agency that should strive to fully understand the experience of our servicemen and women so that they can better serve them. Many veterans suffering with mental health issues as a result of traumas experienced during their service have too often been left to fend for themselves. 
In fact, the VA has come up short so often it has risen to the level of a scandal, with an estimated 22 veterans' death per day, over 8,000 annually as a result of mental health issues. One young veteran told me about the condescending and patronizing language used by some, let me emphasize some, VA staff. There are VA staff on the front lines who are very dedicated and, and very committed to serving our veterans. And it's disturbing that we would have some who don't see it that way. He told me that one staff stooped so low as to call veterans bums when they were seeking financial assistance during hard times. It is outrageous and painful to think that men and women who are willing to die for this country are not being treated with the utmost dignity and respect, but that is the tragic reality and it is unacceptable. The good news is that we can and must do better. I have heard directly from veterans in my district about what they believe can be done to improve this startling trend. I have been working to reform the VA throughout my time in Congress to improve its standards and ensure quality service for our veterans by increasing accountability within the agency. Beyond this, however, there are common sense and innovative ways we can help veterans. And one of them is to facilitate veteran peer support programs. Veterans want to help each other because while many VA employees may have never served in the military, the men and women of our armed forces have, experienced, have, have experiences in common that civilians do not share. Less than 1% of Americans serve in the military and fewer still see combat. They truly understand each other. They speak each other's language, so to speak. The VA should not be an obstacle to veterans coming to each other's aid. Another veteran told me that, quote, peer-to-peer -peer counseling for combat veterans is a critical aspect of a multifaceted approach to healing an invisible wound that lacks a universal fix. Quote, the universal nature of recognizing that the veteran is not alone Acknowledgement, acknowledgement other veterans have faced the same problems and situations and hope from their stories of triumph over their demons enables the combat veteran to take the critical steps of admitting to themselves they have a problem. It helps them, it helps them take the, quote, seemingly hardest step of admitting they are not in a hopeless situation, this veteran told me. He also told me, Peer-to-peer -peer counseling helps the counselor as much as the counseled via preservation of the camaraderie and the fulfillment of helping their own. Far too, many, far too many veterans experience hopelessness and isolation even though they do not have to. This needs to change, and I am sure that we can do better for the men and women who risked everything to protect our way of life. Mr. Speaker, the VA's inadequacies are unacceptable and the agency should embrace common sense solutions to provide veterans with higher quality, effective treatment, and opportunities for healing. I laud my colleague, uh, Representative Zeldin, for his Professor Joseph Dwyer Veterans Peer-to-Peer -peer Program. And as I looked at this legislation, inevitably you go look at who Joseph Dwyer was. And I would encourage this country to, to look at that and to, to look for the other Joseph Dwyers, to look and reach out to those who have served empathetically, and to our veterans who may be watching today, you are not alone. Thank you for your service, Representative Selden. Thank you for your service, and thank you for your work on this important piece of legislation, and I look forward to further consideration by this House. Well, I, I thank the gentleman uh, literally for every single word. Uh, and for his passion and advocacy on behalf of all the veterans, not only in his district, but in mine and elsewhere. Uh, it is so incredibly important for the words uh, that we just heard uh, to be echoed throughout this chamber and inspiration to be found for some of what are great ideas to actually come into effect. Because while there is one Joseph Dwyer who served our country, as the gentleman just pointed out, there are numerous Joseph Dwyers all around America who have not yet lost their struggles. Now it's interesting because uh, we so often call those who lose their bouts with the mental wounds of war, we call it suicide. Joseph Dwyer's last words were, I don't want to die. He was huffing, trying to get temporary relief from his pain. 
The struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder led to him losing his life. And he left behind a young widow and a two-year-old daughter. And there are Joseph Dwyers all around America who have not yet left behind young children and young widows. And it is our duty in this house to fight for them with ever, whatever energy, inspiration, energy that we can find within us to ensure that what starts as a good idea becomes law. The PFC Joseph Dwyer Veteran Peer Support Program is not a new idea. It may be a new idea for this chamber. We created it in New York State back in 2012. At that time, I was in the New York State Senate. We created it as part of the 2012-2013 state budget. And as we just heard from the gentleman from Pennsylvania, veteran to veteran peer support, veterans helping veterans, that's the key. We started in four counties in New York, Suffolk County, my home county, Jefferson, home of the 10th Mountain Division, Fort Drum, Rensselaer County and Saratoga County. The program was so successful in these four counties, and by the way, operating at just $200,000 per county. Here in Washington, we talk about pro programs in the billions and the trillions and the hundreds of millions. In my home county, we helped hundreds of veterans in just that first year. Hundreds of veterans, over 400. $200,000. And we know firsthand how many lives were saved as a result. It was so successful as it started in four counties, it expanded to over a dozen. And in New York State, we're so proud of the Dwyer program. I just came to Congress. This is my first term. I was sworn in January of 2015. And there may be no other mission during my time here in this chamber that will be more satisfying for me personally than to do my part to hopefully save at least one veteran's life. But there are so many more that can be saved if this chamber takes up this bill and makes it law. It doesn't matter whether you live in one of the most populated counties in America of veterans like Suffolk, or if you live in a county that might not be that well populated overall anywhere else in this country, if you raise your hand and you're willing to lay down your life in protection of our freedoms and liberties for that flag, for everything that makes our country great, to protect it and defend it. When you come home, you should have shoes on your feet. There should be food on your table. There should be a roof over your head. Some come home with the physical wounds of war. Others come home with the mental wounds of war. And our veterans, they're fighting for us, all of us, not just for their family or friends, but for strangers too. And isn't it our duty while we're here as elected representatives to be fighting for not just those veterans with the mental wounds of war who we know, but the countless others who are under the radar right now. They're under the radar because they don't know where to go for help. And within our communities, we have veterans, we have veteran service organizations, you know, like the VFW, the American Legion, the Vietnam Veterans of America, the list goes on. We have mental health professionals who want to offer their services. We have others that may want to provide a venue for a meeting, others who may want to provide food. The setting is not that hard to put into place. For someone from our community who may live around the block, from any member of this chamber, the setting is not that hard to put together. For that veteran to go to that room 
and be with maybe eight, ten veterans, understanding the struggles that they are going through so that they can share each other's stories and help each, other's, each other cope with what are the mental wounds of war. It is our duty, it's our opportunity to be able to bring these veterans together and to save lives. As was noted earlier, the statistics are staggering. An estimated 22 veteran deaths per day. 22, that's 8,000 in a year. And it was just about a month ago where the Vet Department of Veterans Affairs indicated that 17 of these 22 individuals weren't even in the VA system. Some don't go for help because they don't know where to go. Others might fear the consequences. What's so important is with the Dwyer program, maintaining confidentiality. So our veterans won't fear that they might lose their job because they're going for help. That is incredibly important as well. A recent New York University Medical Center report indicated that over 270,000 Vietnam-era veterans still suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. These figures are alarming. They're disturbing. The VA doesn't currently offer what we are talking about. This is different. I mean, we are hearing about how some of our veterans are being helped because of pets, dogs, horses, fishing, other activities. Let's think outside the box. Let's not think of just the same way of doing things that have not worked inside the Department of Veterans Affairs. Let's do something different, and we're not starting from scratch. I would encourage any member of this house to look at what we're doing in our home, in my home county of Suffolk, I'm proud to say that we're leading the way in America, and there's a model there that works and should be replicated everywhere. Staffing shortages, untrained support staff, lacking family support services and access to services during non-business hours are just some of the problems that have been reported at the De Department of Veterans Affairs. I recently introduced legislation, H.R. 4513, which would expand nationally the PFC Joseph P. Dwyer Veteran Peer Support Program. PFC Joseph Dwyer was from my district. His home was Mount Sinai, New York. A lot of people know Joseph Dwyer because of an iconic photo from the start of the Iraq War. This picture was on national news. It was on the front cover of magazines. It was that iconic picture of that American soldier post 9-11. The start of the war holding a wounded Iraqi boy as his unit was fighting its way up to Baghdad. It looked like Joseph came home in one piece. A hero. And while it may not have seemed that he didn't come home in one piece because he didn't have some of the physical wounds of war that we unfortunately see from other heroes. He came back with post-traumatic stress disorder. PFC Dwyer died in 2008. Matina, his young widow, was left behind. Megan, his two-year-old daughter, was left behind. And this was an effort that was launched in his honor, the PFC Joseph P. Dwyer Veterans Peer Support Program. It's for our veterans of post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. It provides a safe, confidential, and educational platform where all veterans are welcome to meet with other veterans to build vet-to-vet -vet relationships in support of one another's successful transition from military life to post-service life. We were able to conduct 148 group sessions serving 450 veterans in my home state of Suffolk just in the first year. Since 2013, the program has helped now into the thousands 
as we count veterans from across New York with PTSD and TBI. Through my bill, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs would be authorized to make grants to state and local entities to carry out peer-to-peer -peer mental health programs. The bill would secure $25 million over a three-year period to establish a grant program at the VA that will provide up to $250,000 in funding for all selected entities, such as nonprofits, congressionally chartered VSOs, or state or local agencies to implement a peer-to-peer -peer program. Now let's think about that, $250,000. The Denver VA Hospital Construction Project, originally budgeted for just over $600 million, is operating eight to $900 million over budget. Eight to $900 million over budget. The Department of Veterans Affairs comes to a Veterans Affairs Committee hearing, which I'm proud to uh, serve on that committee. And they say that they are operating off what they refer to as an artificial budget. Has anyone ever heard of an artificial budget? I had one colleague who was asking for when she was going to get a timeline of when we'd have an actual budget. Unable to get an answer, she asked a follow-up question, not trying to embarrass the department. She ended up asking a follow-up question of when she was going to get a timeline of when she was going to get a timeline of when we were going to have an actual budget. When eight to nine hundred million dollars ends up getting spent over budget, think of all of the, the, the hundreds of veterans in one county alone could be helped for just two hundred thousand dollars. The money's there. When the Secretary of VA, when the Department of Veterans Affairs signs off on a relocation and incentive bonus for one of their own, whose position is in Washington, D.C., and she wants to go to Philadelphia, where her family is, and take over a position in charge of their Veterans Affairs Hospital. She arranges a move to get the person, the gentleman in charge of the Philly VA hospital, moved to Los Angeles. So now she gets the job she wanted, she's closer to family, and she gets herself a relocation and incentive bonus over $200,000. Office of Inspector General was outraged. Report recommending that this gets referred to the Department of Justice. Department of Veterans Affairs so outraged at this report from the Inspector General that they end up turning on their own Inspector General, not referring anything to the Department of Justice. One of the responsibilities of this House is oversight. You look at our Constitution, Article 1, is long. All the power is granted to Congress. And look at the powers of the President and the Executive. It's short. And within that article, it talks about the oversight of this body. Oversight to make sure that money is being spent appropriately, wisely, efficiently, and that people are held accountable when they're not doing the right thing on behalf of our veterans. My bill would effectively and efficiently, as it's proven, provide 24-7 peer-to-peer mental health services by trained peer specialists for veterans, reservists, and National Guardsmen, wherever and whenever they are needed. In addition, the Dwyer program will provide group and individual meetings to help foster a greater sense of inclusion and community amongst our veterans. And, as I mentioned earlier, the program also addresses the many privacy concerns that veterans and other service members have as a Dwyer program representatives themselves will be veterans and would not be responsible to the, veter the Department of Veterans Affairs, therefore easing reporting concerns. This is a bill that I've been working on since I took office in January of 2015 working closely with the House Veterans Affairs Committee that 
I serve on the American Legion, other VSOs, the National Disability Rights Network, various health care providers on Long Island, as well as my Veterans Advisory Panel, which is made up of representatives from veteran groups and veterans themselves. I want to thank the Dwyer family for all the inspiration the sacrifice of Joseph has provided to so many in our community and our country, and for me included. There would not be a Dwyer program in the state of New York without the sacrifice of Joseph Dwyer. I want to thank the county of Suffolk, and specifically uh, Tom Ronane, who runs the Veteran Service Office, for the countless hours and the love that, that he and his team have put into this effort that we talk about here tonight on the House floor. To Chris Delaney, Joseph's friend who has served our country as well as Tom has, and has done so much through his work with 911 veterans and also serving on my veterans advisory panel. I think of so many individuals who have given so much of their personal time to make this work. It's an honor to be here on behalf of that team advocating for this cause. I unapologetically love my country. I believe that we live in the greatest nation in the world. I will say that the highlight of my day during my time in Iraq was going back to my tent at the end of the day. There would be care packages waiting for us from strangers, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds from other corners of the country with pictures of tanks and flags and soldiers, cards saying thank you for your service. A generation that came before me didn't get that treatment. And just think, right now we have service members in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere who were four years old on 9-11. Their entire generation, it's all they know. And they went through their entire life from four years old to today knowing exactly what they were signing up for. And actually knowing what they were signing up for gave them all of the motivation and inspiration in the world they needed to put on that uniform. It's a great feeling the first time you get to put on our nation's uniform. For me, it, it wasn't a, a feeling that uh, I had about myself when I looked at, in the mirror and I saw myself wearing that uniform, it was thinking of those generations that came before us, like our nation's greatest generation. It is, it is a challenge for our generation to earn the title of our nation's next greatest generation. Maybe that generation is now serving here in this chamber where 31 members of the House are under the age of 40, including new members who have come in who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. As I think about that eight-year-old and that nine-year-old who wrote that card to that stranger who they did not know, and I think as we stand here today enjoying our freedoms, we think of those who are in harm's way. Strangers, we don't know them, but they're going to come back after seeing things that none of us would ever want to see in our lives. And will we be there for them? Mr. Speaker, there's one other bill that was filed in this chamber called the Fairness for Veterans Act. An Iraq veteran from Long Island, Christopher Goldsmith, received a general discharge, which is a less than honorable discharge. As a result, he doesn't have the same veterans benefits that someone who was separated with an honorable discharge would receive. He came back with post-traumatic stress disorder, and he attempted to take his own life. When your post-traumatic stress disorder 
ends up leading to a discharge with a less than honorable discharge, isn't it our responsibility to ensure that they have the ability to diagnose and treat their post-traumatic stress disorder? Or what if they are applying for an upgrade of their discharge status? Should we put the burden on that veteran to prove that the circumstances that led to their discharge is connected to their post-traumatic stress disorder? No, and this bill addresses that by putting the burden on the government to show that the circumstances weren't connected to what led to that discharge. We must fight for all of our veterans who are willing to fight for us. My bill will bring much needed support, the Dwyer program that is, the Fairness for Veterans Act, thousands of veterans, millions. If you think of all of those not only serving now, but will be serving in the future, and their families. Passing these bills and others to address veterans' mental health is of the highest priority for many of us in this chamber. I will work every day in Congress to spread awareness of these two bills, gather co-sponsors and the support of veterans groups and mental health organizations from all across the country so that we pass this bill as soon as possible. And one last word about our families. We often say thank you to our veterans, as we should. We say thank you to our first responders, our law enforcement, our volunteer firefighters, our EMTs. There are so many people who try to give back, who believe in service because they love their community, their state, their country. They want to give back. They want to leave this place better than they found it. When I was in Iraq on Christmas, this past Christmas, I met the Command Sergeant Major for the 82nd Airborne Division. He's on his 11th deployment. I spoke earlier about that veteran who's four years old, 9-11. But we also have that Command Sergeant Major of the 82nd Airborne Division who was on his 11th deployment. My daughters were born uh, 14 and a half weeks early. They were less than a pound and a half when they were born. They spent their first three and a half months in the hospital. And after they came out of the hospital, stationed out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina at the time, I come across this woman who had three sets of triplets. She lost one from each set. She had six kids, and all six of her kids were special needs. Her shopping cart was full. Her husband was on another deployment to Iraq. And with a smile on her face, with a very positive attitude, she's telling my wife and I all the resources that were available to us on Fort Bragg so that we could be better parents. That was the last time that I would ever have the nerve to feel sorry for myself, for my wife, to feel sorry for herself for what we were going through with our daughters who came home. And they came home with about a dozen medications each and heart monitors. They were going through a hard time. But this woman, with her husband on another deployment, her shopping cart full, with six special needs kids with her as she's walking through the Fort Bragg Commissary, with that attitude, with that positive attitude, a smile on her face, helping us be better parents, I realized that when she was going to go home, no one's going to be waiting with an outstretched hand and a hug to say thank you for your service. This effort tonight, these bills, it's for our veterans in need. It's for their families too. And it's the way that we give back. This is how to say a proper thank you. And I yield back.